Greetings from China. Um, I realize I haven't talked much about my life outside of this uh, channel. Obviously, this is not my job. My actual job does require me to live overseas for most of the time. So I am recording from a new city, new apartment. So in the first place, if I sound weird, that's why. Completely different recording space, which means uh, all my EQ settings are off. I need to figure them out again, which took me, what, two months the first time? I can probably get it in a month. So hopefully I will sound like a human being at some point. Uh, second, uh, I have a, a little comment to make about the company, which is currently sponsoring about every third uh, YouTube channel. Uh, NordVPN sucks. I've been using Nord. It has not connected a single time since I've been here, which I, I switched over to it. I used to use Express, and I switched because Nord is half the price, but, you know, getting a discount on a service that doesn't work isn't actually a discount. If you are hearing this at all, it's because I've been able to upload it via ProtonVPN, a free alternative I installed as a backup. So, yeah, not too impressed. Not too impressed with the uh, with old Nord. I feel like for the money they're paying everyone on YouTube to sponsor him, they can get a service that works. But never mind that. You aren't here to hear me complain about uh, YouTube sponsors. Or maybe you are. That appears to be the way to become popular quickly these days. But you are here because, as promised, I have opted to reassess my tier list. So earlier this year, I did a tier list of basically the genres that I felt would be good for developers, not so much for the end user, not for the customer, not for most likely not for you listening, but rather for the people making the games, sort of based on which ones are most competitive and which ones uh, kind of make the most money traditionally, which ones have the largest audiences, things like that. And it's, we're coming up on the halfway point, and I figured this is a good time to reassess, and I looked back over my tier list, which you should be seeing right now. And some of these I stand by, most of them I stand by, but some of them really hard to justify in light of what's been going on. So I would like to take a quick breeze over these. There's a couple of these that if I were doing this again, I would promote or demote them into different categories. So very quickly, we're gonna go back over those. And I'm gonna start with the one in the bottom death slot which was maybe the largest mistake I made. I My logic behind putting Metroidvania platformers in this death slot where basically no one can succeed was Silksong. Now, Silksong keeps getting delayed, which is part of it. But the other reason I, I would reassess this, and it's not just because Turbo Kid is the most popular review I've done yet, although that does help. That does help. But it's looking around, people are not, they're not just holding their breath, waiting for Silk Song to come out. Um, people don't even seem to be, surprisingly for what is presumably going to be the one of the biggest indie games when it does finally launch, people don't seem to really care that much about Silk Song. I'm actually kind of surprised. Um, granted, if you follow indie development cycles, they get pushed back all the time, so this is not a surprise to me. But the point is, people aren't sitting around and waiting. They aren't waiting for that one to come out. There have been a number of strong titles in this subgenre, and I have every reason to assume that there will be more. So this was definitely the worst call I made. If I was to do this again, I would promote this at least one slot, if not two. I mean, this needed to be a lot higher up. This is clearly a much, much, much better year than I originally thought when I did this in January. Now, while we're on the subject of platformers, uh, the most absurd thing I did was having uh, conventional platformers, basically NES and Super NES style platformers, as higher than Metroidvania. I don't know what universe that's justified, so we need to demote those. Now, at the time, my logic is based on a few things that have kind of not turned out to be true. Uh, a lot of it was, well, these games seem to do better on Switch, and you know, just kind of a change in what the mobile environment's looking like. So maybe Steam Deck and similar devices, they'll do well. Doesn't seem like they are. Uh, also doesn't seem like Switch is that important to market. 
for indie games like it was this time last year, so there's that too. Uh, another assumption was based on Pizza Tower, and I'm thinking, well, people are going to see the success of that game. They're going to make more of these games that appeal to that speedrunner audience. Doesn't appear to be happening. Put simply, I haven't seen any real winners in this category. And putting this that far above Metroidvanias was a terrible, terrible mistake. So we're going to demote that one uh, a category as well. Now let's go to the top. Uh, I definitely made some mistakes at the top of my list. I would like to reassess horror games. Now, there's no question that when this year ends, that when we look at the top 10, at the very least the top 20, we're going to see a horror game in there, probably several. But the assessment was on whether it was a good year overall if you were developing a game like that. And I just, the more I look around, most horror games don't do that well. What you have is a very small number of them that really break out and blow up. They become memes. It's a meme genre. And because of that, it's even more hit-driven than most of them. It is very feast or famine. And if you're not one of those top 10, top 20, top 30 games, you're probably not selling that well. So while I would still rank that one pretty high, putting it at the top seems like a mistake. So... If I were to reassess this, I would bump this down a slot. And as long as we're at the top, I want to reassess strategy, which the basis for that was looking at just raw stats and seeing that strategy games in general tend to overperform. Here's the issue with that. Strategy games are kind of a special category. There are a few types of video games where people will stick with them. They'll play them for hundreds, if not thousands of hours. They'll stick with them for years and years. And we, most of them are obvious. Your MMOs, kind of anything live service, a lot of competitive games, especially those used in competitions, that kind of thing. Strategy falls into that. And when you look at the games that strategy fans like, they tend to be from kind of storied, long-running series A tier. So we're talking Civilization, we're talking Total War, we're talking Galsiv, things like that. And it is very, very hard to get someone to break away from those. You know, the thing about people who play games like this is they play video games a lot. They do not play a lot of video games. You know, I'm very much deep in the Paradox Interactive scene myself. Uh, a lot of people who are into games like Europa Universalis will play that game for, you know, 1,000 hours a year easily and won't touch anything else. You know, they stick to that. They're excited. You know, there's a new expansion out. They're excited for that. They're not necessarily looking for anything new. And another point, I was reading an article by one of my fellow Super Jump uh, writers, Joss Beiser, who mentioned that one of the problems with strategy games with video games, when you're showing off what a game looks like, screenshots, for example, you can show off screenshots that make the game look impressive, or you can show off screenshots that show what the game is like to actually play. And the problem with strategy games is with your A-tier games, the graphics are usually very good, so you do have those visually impressive screenshots you can show off, but the actual guts of the game looks like a spreadsheet. Not very excited. Hard to get people really energized when they're just looking at numbers. And that's a problem. You can put out a lot of these kind of interesting looking indie strategy games. I can think of several that look pretty neat, but it's so hard to get people excited, even the fans. You know, a person who's psyched for the next Stellaris uh, expansion probably isn't going to care so much about a similar looking new game. It's just really hard to get people into these. So I think strategy I had way overplaced. I, if I were doing this again, I would move this at least one category down. I might demote it by two, just based on what I've been seeing. It doesn't seem like it's a great year overall, if you're, again, if you're not in one of these A-tier companies. Now, action RPGs. I'm actually quite happy with where I put JRPGs, which I, I still insist are making to come back. I think action RPGs I may have placed a little low. Now, the issue here, I've said a few times that I think we're reaching a point where the title indie game 
is kind of losing its usefulness. You know, when 99.9% .9 of games are indies, what does that term even mean? And action RPGs, the biggest ones, still tend to be the flashiest ones. And some of those are ones that really start to blur that line. I mean, when you look at, like, the last year or two and also what's coming up, I mean, how comfortable would you be calling Lies of P an indie game? How comfortable would you be calling Black Myth an indie game. Now, these are some of the biggest games out of the scene, but when you look at them, they are basically A-tier games. These do not look anything like what people think of when they think of indie games. They are very have very high production values. And so that ends up, it's kind of the same issue we had with the uh, first-person shooters, which I thought about replacing, but I think that's where it should be. The problem is, if you're competing in the action RPG space, it really helps if you do have the increased budget that comes from a really good publisher, for example, which not everyone can get. That's going to be a thing that comes up in State of Indie this year, absolutely. Nevertheless, when looking at the scene, people are definitely most psyched for those flashy action RPGs, and very reluctantly, I am willing to promote this a slot. So those are those are the changes. There are a few others I considered. I thought, as I said, I thought about uh, replacing first-person shooters because they've been some really successful ones. But I kind of agree with what I heard from the FPS developers last year. It's just a really competitive market. I thought about changing deck builders. Again, on the basis of one game, Slay the Spire 2 announced. We don't know anything about it yet, but it's going to suck a lot of the auction out of the room. But given that I already kind of blew that call with Silk Song, I'm not really willing to do it again. So the rest of these are going to leave where they are. Uh, but what do you think? Uh, what do you feel are the genres that have the best prospect for, let's say, the second half of the year? Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on this issue based on whatever. Give me your opinions. I would love to know.